Good morning, everybody. Thank you again for coming. It's good to see you here again. Um, we take your time very seriously, so thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to come and, and talk to us today. Hopefully, you'll find this of uh, uh, great use to you, and you'll be able to take that uh, knowledge back and apply it to your work uh, in every day. Uh, these uh, workshops are not very formal in, in a format, so if anybody has any questions along the way, feel free to raise your hand, ask the question, and we'll uh, answer it as we can see it fit. So without further ado, let's start. Why are we even talking about energy efficiency again today? Um, one of the reasons that energy efficiency is becoming more important is because of the increased scrutiny that everybody has on how much carbon, how much fossil fuels everybody's using. So um, we have, for the longest time, energy, and even today, energy is relatively inexpensive, especially a natural gas. So why are we worried about it? But there are other influences that um, influence our decisions these days. One of them is cost of carbon. In Ontario, we have cap and trade in place. We have additional cost of carbon that uh, is planned to be introduced Canada-wide. So everybody has to be aware of that, that adds additional cost to the natural gas. The other one is, of course, business advantages to being green. Uh, a lot of businesses today are trying to present themselves as being very green, very conscientious about the environment. So that's another reason of looking at this. And the third one, of course, is to uh, some of the supply chain is requested to reduce their energy intens intensity. So how do you do that? One thing that I have um, over the last seven, eight years that I've been involved in this business noticed is that people are looking at energy cost as a way of energy management, which is okay. That's one way of reducing your cost. The problem, of course, becomes when you have energy that costs less, but still produces the same amount of carbon. So energy management, energy cost, and energy efficiency are not necessarily always the same things. So we have to have that clear. You can buy energy cheaper, but you will still make the same amount of GAGs. But if you reduce the amount of energy that you're using, regardless of the price you pay for it, you will reduce your GAGs. So why energy efficiency? Why not just some other ways of doing it? Why not switch energy? Why not change from natural gas to less carbon intensive fuels? Well, one problem, of course, is complexity of doing that. Energy efficiency has the advantage of being very simple to grasp. The less you use, the less you pollute, the less GAGs you make. Simple as that. Second one is it's a low cost. People don't understand that often, but um, efficiencies can be, great, can be gained in your equipment by uh, using what we call low-hanging fruit. You can just turn off stuff that you don't use when you don't use it, or you can use it more efficiently, or you can use the same amount of energy but to make twice as many widgets. All of them are relatively low-cost upgrades without buying especially new and new capital equipment. And the third one is, of course, proven results. There is studies upon studies, not just in Ontario, not just in Canada, but worldwide that confirm that energy efficiency, dollar for dollar, is the most cost-effective way of reducing your GAGs and making your operation better. So our industrial programs have been here for a while. We have saved about 110 million cubic meters of natural gas annually, 20 million kilowatt hours, and over 800,000 cubic meters of water working with our customers in a three-year period alone. So we're not just talking. We, we are actually working with customers such as yourselves to reduce the energy that you guys use. And participating in our programs, of course, helps you with bottom line and reducing your CO2 emissions. Win-win situation. And as you, we go through this exercise, you will also see that there is a, on, on, a, on your facilities uh, side as well, usually energy efficiency gets you better facility, um, more comfortable workplace, and also the uh, effects are much more um, uh, feel good rather than just cost cutting. So how cost effective? We talked about the energy efficiency being cost effective. How cost effective? 
So I have two quotes here. One is from American Council for Energy Efficient Economy. This is in the States. Uh, that says that energy efficiency programs cost utilities two to three times less than generating the same amount of energy um, when they implement energy efficiency programs. In Ontario, in 2016, uh, Environmental Commissioner of Ontario has put a um, paper out where it states for our portfolio, Enbridge's portfolio, had the cost, a benefit to cost ratio of 2.67, which means for every dollar that we invested into the energy efficiency, and when I say we, it's both Enbridge and you, um, we got back to $2.67 out of it. That's a pretty good return on investment. And one way of, the, of energy, to implement energy efficiency, of course, is to uh, take care of your waste heat. And when we talk about waste heat, everybody's first question is, where can you find a waste heat? <coughs> if you found it, where would you use it? And the third one is, of course, would it be worth recovering? All of those have to be answered, and all of those has to be understood if you want a successful implementation of heat recovery projects. One or the other doesn't work. So waste heat sources. If you consider this graph, natural gas in Ontario in 2015 was 40% of all the fuel type in Ontario. That includes uh, uh, diesel for trucks, that includes every, every source of energy in Ontario. 40% of it was natural gas. And this is how it was used. Out of that, 40% of the overall energy in Ontario, 26% of that gas was used in industrial facilities such as ours. 26% of 40%. And 20 to 50% of the energy used in an industrial facility is waste. This has been proven over and over. And we'll go through some examples today to give you an idea where that 20 to 50% goes. So that means 105 million MMBTUs, or for those who use terajoules, 110,000 terajoules of energy is being wasted by industry in Ontario every year. Where is this waste coming from? If you look at, I, I got this from a gentleman that I talked to recently, this graph, and it, it really uh, made me realize how energy is used, so I'm gonna copy the graph here. Essentially, if you draw the energy on, on, on the on y-axis, energy is being converted. You need something, so you convert energy. You take, uh, for example, natural gas, you create steam, or you create, uh, you take you create compressed air, and in which way energy is converted, then energy is being distributed around your uh, place, and energy is being used. It's a simple cycle. You, you create energy, you distribute it, you use it. But it's not so simple as that along each step there are losses. There are conversion losses, there are distribution losses, and there's end user losses as well. And if you really had to put uh, numbers around it, this would be roughly the scale. End user losses would actually be the highest. But they're also hardest to uh, attack. So we'll talk about each one of these losses as we go along today. One other way of looking at this is if this is the money you invested to generate the uh, energy that you needed in your facility, this is the amount of, uh, amount of money you would actually realize as your benefit. The rest is waste. You just throw it out. So how do you get more out of that? If you look at the simple payback, money invested divided by money realized. And if you look at all the sources of energy that you uh, are using in the facility, so you have all the energy on the input. The green arrow shows the energy that you actually get out of it. All the other arrows show the losses along the way. If you can take some of those losses, put it back into the input, you would reduce your money that you need to invest into facility, and you would improve your simple payback. It's, it's as simple as that. So if you ever have an idea of, of uh, doing a waste heat project and you're running into the problem with your accounting, for example, or, or trying to figure out the base case or do the business case for, the, for your imp implementation, talk to one of us. 
and we'll help you develop the business case that will show exactly this. And you will see, uh, I had in, uh, those of you who attended these workshops and those who haven't, you've seen maybe my uh, graph about uh, uh, paybacks. I mean, we're talking IRR of uh, 130%. You don't get that from any other investment. Where did losses come from? So we'll start with the conversion losses because this is the first step in, in getting an energy. So you're taking some form of energy, you, tr you transform it into the energy that you actually need in your process. So conversion losses, for example, on the steam boiler, and we'll start with that because most of you are familiar with the steam boilers. Input energy, if you take 100%, if you had take 100 units of energy, put it into the boiler, that's your natural gas. This is roughly how it shapes out. Half a percent goes into your shell losses, 3% usually on the blowdown, 20% goes up the flue. So essentially, you're throwing 20% of the energy up the flue stack. And you get 76.5% roughly in your steam. And this is really what you have. This is what you want. And considering you have a fixed requirement for that steam, you have to put input energy that's 23.5% higher value. So this is one of those stereotypical heat recovery methods. This, when you talk to people about heat recovery, that's the first thing that they think. They take the heat from the boiler's flue gas and, the, and they recover it. And it's good reason why that's a first thought, because how heat is often medium grade. It's always there. As long as the boiler is on, the heat is there. Um, energy available is very easy to determine. We'll go through the example. But it's very simple to find out how much energy you're actually wasting in your steam boiler. Very similar ap approach can be taken for hot water boiler. It's all the same. So how to recover it? Most of you have heard of these. Uh, feed water economizers and condensing economizers. So we'll see how those work. So feed water economizer, it's a heat exchanger. Essentially, that's all it is. Um, it's installed typically within the existing stack, sometimes even within the boiler itself. It preheats the feed water um, to reduce the boiler energy use because you, it, what boiler does is takes the cold water, heats it up to create steam, and then generates the steam. So if you don't put cold water into the boiler, if you put preheated water into the boiler, the energy that the boiler has to generate is slightly less. That's all it does. And it recovers what we call sensible heat only. So let's see how that looks like in the simple steam plant. You usually have a boiler, you have the aerator, and sometimes you have condensate tank to return some of the condensate back. You put natural gas and combustion, you generate heat, which generates the process steam, and part of that steam goes into the deaerator because you have to get rid of the oxygen in the stream. Make up water and the condensate return. Some mixture thereof goes into the condensate tank. And then the water from the DA goes into the boiler as a boiler feed water. Because it's now purified, it can go into the boiler. That's typical steam plant system, very simple. But let's see how this works in real life. If, let's say, you have 50% condensate return at 180 degrees F, 50% makeup water, you have 100 PSI steam and 6 PSI in your deaerator, you will generally have about 450 degrees F boiler stack temperature. And if you put feed water economizer into that stream, so now you can recover some of the heat from that 450 degree stream. You put deaerator stream, instead of going directly into the boiler, you put it through the feed water economizer. Uh, at 6 PSI, it'll be about 230 degrees F, but it'll be 267 degrees F once it leaves the feed water economizer. So you gained about 37 degrees F just from the, uh, from the feed water economizer, from the waste heat. And now instead of boiler leaving, boiler uh, exhaust gas being 450 degrees F, now it's 320 degrees F. So you reduce the amount of energy you're wasting, and you recover some through the stream. And here's how you calculate. This is as simple as it gets. Uh, you, you will have a natural gas combustion percentage chart in your book, so you can easily find these things. But essentially, down the here is an excerpt from it. Let's say you have 5% excess oxygen, 450 degrees F 
exhaust gas before the feed water economizer. Minus 70 degrees, it's the ambient temperature. You always look at the temperature, net temperature, rather than just uh, uh, fixed temperature of the boiler. So that puts a 380 degrees F exhaust temperature higher than the ambient, which puts you right here, 380 degrees F. On the other side, 5% five degree, five oxygen puts you at 80.6% your efficiency. It's as simple as that. That's how you calculate the efficiency of the boiler. As long as you know what your temperature of the exhaust flue gases are and what's your level of um, oxygen level, that's all you need to calculate the efficiency. So let's see, after the feed water economizer, you have 320 degrees F, remember in that example? We'll subtract the ambient temperature, we get 250 degrees F. That puts us on the chart here between 240 and 260, and if we extrapolate the efficiency at 5% oxygen, you get new efficiency of 83.9%. So by installing the feed water economizer, you have improved the efficiency by about 3% automatically. The rule of thumb that we always use, feed water economizer can usually recover about 3%. If you really, really good application, can re recover about 5%. So if somebody is selling you feed water economizer and say you're going to save 15%, talk to us. It's probably not possible. So how does that look like in real life? If we think about, this was an example, but how does this look like in one of the projects that our customers has done with us? Well, this is how it worked out. Total investment of the economizer installed was about 23,625, $23,626. It saved them about 100,000 cubic meters of natural gas. And we gave them 11, almost $12,000 incentive. So their cost was actually almost half that. So for about $12,000 investment, they have gotten back 100,000 cubic meter savings every year. $29,000 every year of savings for $12,000 net investment. Payback is about half a year. And by doing that, they saved 191 tons of CO2 equivalent. So this is a simple project as you can get in energy efficiency. If you have a steam boiler and you don't have feed water economizer or some sort of economizer, please talk to us because that is a very easy thing to implement. And typically, people like it because it doesn't affect their process. They don't have to worry about how it affects the down, downstream equipment. So to recap, advantage of the feed water economizer is that they're relatively in, in, inexpensive element. Um, you've seen the twenty to thirty thousand dollars is typical price range. Um, both heat source and sink are functionally independent, so you don't have to worry about when you have a heat sink, when you have a heat source, and match them up. They're automatically matched up, and the savings are about three to five percent of the boiler consumption. The problem is if you look at the sketch here, you go from 450 to 320 degrees F. 320 degrees F is still a considerable amount of heat. So you're leaving a lot of heat on the table with a feed water economizer. The other limitation is because feed water economizers are inexpensive, they don't have any special stainless steel materials or something like that. So you really don't want anything to condense in them. So what happens is you're limited on that. You can only use feed water through this. That's why it's called feed water economizer, because putting anything colder in there could risk condensing in the, in the economizer and ruining your economizer really quickly. So what we really need, when you think about it, what you look at a uh, feed water economizer, we need something that can handle lower flue gas temperatures. So that instead of uh, exhausting 320 degrees F, wouldn't it be nice if we can exhaust at about 100 degrees F? It would be good to recover some of the latent heat, not just sensible heat. And for those of you who are, who are not sure about the terminology, sensible heat is the heat that we see. So if you heat the water, it goes from 0 to 100 degrees Celsius or from 32 to 212 degrees F. As for every degree F, you have an amount of energy that's being put into the water. And you see it until it starts boiling. When it starts boiling, when it turns into the steam, now you release some of the latent heat as well. Energy in the water keeps growing, but you don't see the change in the temperature. That's that latent heat that we're talking about. 
And what happens in the flue gases of all sorts, not just in the boilers, any flue gas will have a certain amount of moisture in it, typically between 8 and 12 percent. So now what happens is that moisture is leaving together with the flue gas stream. If you can squeeze that moisture out, now you're getting that latent heat, that phase change energy back into your stream. So by condensing the moisture out of the flue gas, you will release about 1,000 BTUs for every pound of moisture back into your system. So you can get much more heat energy out of the same uh, principle, essentially. And it would be nice to have flexible installation options. Feed water economizers are inexpensive, but you have to put one on each boiler. It's a very rare application where you can put feed water economizer offline. So you can feed, the, let's say, three boilers with one feed water economizer. That usually doesn't work that way. So it would be nice if you can have something you can put offline and you have three boiler system. Whenever you switch the boiler, the, the boiler that is currently working is using the same heat energy recovery mechanism as the other one without the investment of three separate ones. So what we really need, what we really talk about here is condensing economizer. Condensing economizer, of course, you can put on top of the feed water economizer. If you already have feed water economizer, you can put condensing economizer after it because feed water economizer, as we said, leaves a lot of heat and it hasn't recovered any of the latent heat. So all the moisture in the flue gas stream is still available to, to harvest. Then, of course, you could put makeup water through the feed water economizer directly. You don't have to preheat it. You don't have to take the boiler feed water. You take cold makeup water from the city and put it directly through the condensing economizer because it can handle that a low temperature input. And then you can put that stream back into your makeup water stream rather than going directly into the boiler. Now you can get the temperatures down theoretically to 60 degrees F coming out of the condensing economizer. Um, my personal preference is I would leave that at about 90 to 110 degrees F, um, only because at 60 degrees F, um, exit temperature will create your own weather system. If you've ever stood underneath the flue gas stack, they're coming out that cold, you will have nice little moisture coming out of it and, and you know, showering you. So I would not go that low, but even if you go down to 100 degrees F, you have recovered amazing amount of energy. The other thing that I really like about condensing economizer is for everybody who's using process water, who's preheating a large and constant amount of process water, and you have boiler, I would always advise using condensing economizer for the process water stream. It's one of the easiest ways to preheat the water, and it reduces your energy use in water heating tremendously. My personal, uh, personal experience, we had a customer installing economizer that didn't have feed water, no condensing economizer, and we installed condensing economizer directly onto the unit. We didn't even bother with the feed water economizer because the process water amount that they had was phenomenal and they used all of it. And this is the project I'm talking about. $276,000 investment. It's a relatively large condensing economizer. Installed the whole cost, there is nothing else there. Um, but it saved them, look at the savings, 660,000 cubic meters of natural gas every year. They added a little bit of electricity because when you're installing condensing economizer offline, which means that two of his boilers can use the same condensing economizer, you have to use the fan to pull the flue gas out of each stack. It's not a big uh, uh, cost. For, for the savings of $162,000 every year. We gave them $67,000 worth of incentive, their payback 1.1 years. 1.1 year payback on $276,000 investment. It means they're getting a lot out. Look at the savings in tons of CO2 equivalent. 1,200 tons CO2 equivalent savings by doing this project alone. And the funny part is they actually had steam water, a steam boiler for steam, and then they had a direct contact water heater for the water heating that was natural gas as well. We completely eliminated the need for direct contact water heater 
we just use waste heat to preheat all of their water. And it's about 15,000 pounds of water every hour. So they are more expensive because you have corrosion resistant materials, condensing economizers. Can be used with multiple boilers, however, so you don't have to have three at $25,000, you can just buy one. It's not only for the, for the feed water, it's good for the makeup water and it's good for the process water. And savings are typically on their own, about 10% of the boiler energy consumption if you add it to the existing feed water system. So if you have feed water economizer and you put condensing economizer, you will save about 10% of energy going into the steam boiler. If you're starting from scratch, you have no feed water economizer and you have good solid heat sink, you can, go, you can skip the feed water economizer, you can go straight to the condensing economizer and save 15% of your boiler consumption. It will, it will, in proper application, what it will do, because you have feed water economizer that saves 5%, and you have condensing economizer that saves 10%. If you don't install feed water economizer now, all the energy goes into the condensing economizer, and assuming it's properly sized, it will recover the same amount of energy as the two economizers. Because it was the, the, in our case, the exhaust gas, instead of going from 450 to 350, let's say, yeah, 350 in, uh, 320 in the after feed water economizer, it will go at 450 directly into condensing economizer. And condensing economizer will lower the temperature down to the same 100 degrees F if it's properly sized. So to properly assess that, we, our energy solution consultants, we are always available to help you out. We have uh, probes, we, have the, uh, we can do boiler flue gas measurements for you, we can, do, uh, we can pay for an audit that somebody will do uh, measurements for you if you need to. Um, the idea is that we can connect you with the right answer for your problem on the steam boiler. So if you have a steam boiler and you think you can benefit from this, feel free to contact any one of us. Um, and we'll help you out uh, getting the results that you want. If nothing else, what you will get is the honest, unbiased opinion. We are not, we're not going to sell you equipment. There is nothing that we sell. So we will tell you what we really find at your uh, facility. And why do we say that we can do that? Is because we, we have experience. We've been around for over 20 years. We have combined all our team together performed over 1,000 boiler tests, heat mass balances on the boiler systems. And we have auditing process in place internally to ensure that when we give you estimate on savings, we really believe those are the savings you can get. It will not always be the best number. It will not be the worst number. It will be a very realistic number. So we don't, we're not really vendors. We're not in the, in the business of making sure that your business case looks as good as possible without any um, objection to the reality. So that brings us to the first workbook example. If you take a look at your workbook, uh, we'll start on the second page. So we should be all here. So we will install a condensing economizer onto the boiler. We will say that we already determined that the boiler flue gas gives us energy of 1.65 million BTU, MMBTUs per hour. We'll say that condensed economizer can re recover 98% of that heat, which is a typical number. And we will say that we process about 30 GPMs of water, process water coming into the facility at 50 degrees F, which is typical city water and we wanted to get up to the 170 degrees F at the exit of the condensing economizer. So this summarizes our inputs, and if you look at the, uh, the numbers here, you will see that symbol is in the middle, units of measure, and the values. And the idea is we're gonna put those into the formulas on the next page.
And once we figure out how much heat we recover out of the condensing economizer, we'll do one additional step. We will find out, can the condensing economizer actually supply all of the heat to get us to 170 degrees F? And if not, what is the end temperature that it can supply us at? And it's very important to know, because if you have a requirement of 170 degrees F at the exit, and you can't reach it, you would want to also size up, a, a, let's say, a small heat exchanger or some other method to top up that heat from the condensing economizer. Then once you take everything into account, you see whether that's a, a, a good business case to pursue or not. So if you could calculate that, I'll give you, let's say, five minutes, and then we'll see who's closest, and those who's closest and first will get um, a little gift. And you can write up all your results on the page following, on the third page in, in the, your workbook. You have space to put in the results. We have managed to get our thinking around the, how to recover the heat from the boiler flue gases. And I started with that for a reason, because about 20 to 25 percent of, of the energy put into the boilers will actually go up the stack, literally in flames. But there is also other sources of losses on the boiler. We mentioned them. One of them was the sh uh, shell losses, which I wouldn't worry about. Usually, unless your boiler is in a really bad shape, usually it's about half a percent to one percent. But the one that's bigger one is the blowdown loss. I put it down here at three percent because that's what the typical blowdown losses should be. We've seen facility where blowdown losses were as high as 15%. We've seen facility that we see typically run blowdown loss at about 7 to 8%. If you have a big boiler, that adds up. Especially because when you think about it, what the blowdown stream does, you take steam that you just created, you put all this money and energy into creating a steam, then you turn on the valve either automatically or manually, and you let that steam out. Essentially, that's all you do. Worst part is, because it's so hot, usually you have to mix it with the cold water to actually be allowed to put it into your sewer. So you're not only losing the energy from the boiler, you're also losing the cold water that you put in. And as we all know, water is not cheap. So how does it work essentially? You put blowdown stream. In typical application, you put it into some sort of blowdown tank. You vent the flash steam that is created uh, when the steam gets from the boiler at 100 PSI to the blowdown tank at a, some lower temperature. And then you drain the rest of it out into your drain by adding cold water in. That's it. So you get 3% of fuel and fresh water goes down the drain, literally. It would be much better if you can put heat exchanger. So when you release that blowdown stream, instead of mixing it with the cold water, it goes through the heat exchanger. It still gets released into the drain after that, but by now it has been, energy out of it has been used to preheat the makeup water. That's a good first step. The better step is then when you have that heat exchanger, then you put flash tank, and instead of venting the steam that goes in from the boiler, you actually recover that steam, you put it back to the deaerator or to some sort of receiver for the low uh, pressure steam. So now you recovered all the energy that you could. Your blowdown stream is now at about 70, 60, 70 degrees F. You don't have to mix it with the cold water. It's a win-win situation, and this is not a complex system. As a matter of fact, you can buy these pre-packaged. All you do is you connect your blowdown stream, you put the makeup water in or out, uh, you put it next to the drain, and you connect it to your DA receiver. It all comes on a skid, essentially. For relatively modest investment, you, you can recover anywhere between, depending on your system, between 15 and 3 percent of your energy. So step one, if you do find that you have very high blowdown rates, 10, 15 percent, don't recover the heat off it. Reduce it first. Um, I mean, it's nice to recover the heat, but if you don't need to waste that, don't waste it in the first place. Recover it, operate your boiler to the, at the blowdown levels that are reasonable, and then quantify those blowdown rates 
and then recover it. And we can help you out with that. Any one of our energy solutions consultants can come over and, and talk to you based on your um, findings from the water supplier and the chemical supplier. We can figure out what your blowdown rates are. The other um, converter of energy, even though it's not natural gas user, is air compressor. And I, I'm talking about air compressors because most of you will have it in your facility. It's just a matter of how big it is, but most of the industrial facilities will use compressed air one way or the other. And when you look at the compressed air, if you thought that boilers were banned, look at the numbers for the compressed air. 100 units of input energy, 15% of useful energy out. And that's a good case. You have to remember, this useful energy of 50% is coming out of the compressor. That doesn't account for your losses and leaks in the distribution system. We'll talk about them later. This is just conversion losses, which means that about 80% of the heat of the energy that you put into the compressor is converted into waste heat, 80%. And again, those are optimistic numbers. Your compressor probably operates worse than that. So what can you do about it? How can you recover heat of the compressor? Usually in a very, very simple way, and I'll show you a couple of examples later on. There is no risk to negatively affect production because the compressor is already wasting that heat anyways. You don't have to do anything for it to waste heat. It just sits there. Um, for water-cooled air compressors, it does help your payback if the heat sink is close by. It's not necessary always but it helps in the payback because you avoid building a long uh, piping system. So let's talk about the water-cooled air compressor. You all know what the air compressor looks like. It has a motor. It has something that's called air end where it compresses the air. It takes the air from the ambient. Compressed air comes out of it. On a water-cooled compressor, you usually have a link from the water, -cool, water cooling tower into the compressor heat exchanger where it then cools the oil that actually cools the compressor. For the simplicity, I'm just showing the cooling tower loop going into the compressor box. So water from the cooling tower comes in, takes the heat out of the air end, and now it would be nice to put it into the heat exchanger because that heat is a valuable heat and there is a lot of it. If you have 300 horsepower compressor, there is a lot of heat going in there. And then send it back to the cooling tower, rather than sending really hot water back to the cooling tower directly. You can use it for the process water in or out. You can use it for any other heat sink that you have available. You can use it, for example, for the glycol loop if you have a makeup air unit or something like that. I, used to, I, I like to use process water streams because they're constant. If you put glycol loop, if you put HVAC application, we get about half a year worth of energy savings. If you use process that runs all the time, you get full year worth of energy savings. So if you can find a process sink, use it. Again, an example of the actual project that we've done with the customer. $21,000 worth of heat exchanger and installation, saved in 230,000 cubic meters. 230,000 cubic meters. Those are the savings of about $65,000 at today's prices. And we gave them $10,000 incentive, so 50% incentive. For $10,000, they are saving $64,000 a year. Payback is 0.3 years, and they're saving about 430 tons of CO2 equivalent. All it took is cutting into the two pipes that were running next to each other, one going to the cooling tower, one coming into the boiler room for the makeup water. All we did is put a, a heat exchanger in between. So before the um, water that has gone through the compressor, before it goes back into the cooling tower, goes into the heat exchanger, preheats the makeup water for their boiler that runs 8,000 hours all the time. Everybody's happy. 230,000 cubic meter savings. And this was... Um, I believe 200, uh, 300 horsepower boiler, uh, boiler, compressor, sorry. So simple as that. So again, these projects don't have to be complicated. 
You will have a lot of people come to you, make it sound really complex, but it's really not. All you have to do is think about what your heat sink is, what your heat source is, how best to match them. What about air compressors? We all know that air compressors usually sit somewhere in the little bit of a, of a room because they're noisy. And oddly enough, they're hot. So if we put them into a room on the side of the facility, we close the doors, we put the shutters, and we put the um, openings into that room so we can get cold air in because compressors like to run with the colder air. They don't like hot air. Um, and secondly, then we put a big exhaust fan above them to exhaust all that heat because they're really hot if you, close the, if you enclose them in the, in, in the room. So why not put, instead of exhausting it in the winter time at least, put a ducting and put that hot air into the facility that sits right next to the compressor room. That will reduce your uh, gas bill for, natural, uh, for the unit heaters or for your makeup air and it will recover about 80 to 90 percent of all the energy you put into compressor. So out of 100 horsepower compressor, you can recover 80 horsepower as the heat into your facility. And I've seen these applications can be very simple, just like shown there, hole in the wall, duct, that's it. Or it can be a little bit more complex and longer ducting system to take it where you need it, say in the shipping door area where it's always cold and you dump all that air there. So then you need to put a fan in the duct to pull that heat further. Um, I've seen people who have in these um, exhaust streams, they actually have temperature controlled dampers. So depending on the outdoor temperature, the damper automatically closes, opens, allows the hot air to go into the facility or outside. They don't have to worry about it. And I've never seen application more expensive than $25,000 with all the bells and whistles. So this is the project, an example, $7,000 project investment, saved 30,000 cubic meters. This is a small air compressor and saved them $8,500. Uh, we're getting three and a half thousand dollars in incentive, but it's a half year payback for simple implementation. And what usually happens is because you usually want to put duct and you have a little fan in it, and if you put it above the shipping doors, it'll be more effective than anything else you can do around the shipping doors. I've seen people put dock seals on the, on the shipping doors. All that does is if you have negative air, the air will come somewhere else. If you put air curtains, it'll be the same thing. If you put uh, infrared heaters, usually you see infrared heaters above the shipping doors. Well, think about it. What does an infrared heater heat? It heats the concrete. It doesn't heat the actual air. So you still haven't accomplished anything. But if you put a bunch of air, you're creating a curtain automatically, and it's nice and warm, and it doesn't cost you anything. Savings of 55 tons of CO2 equivalent with a simple project, $7,000 investment. Actually, by the time we pay for the incentive, their investment is $3,500. Again, if you're interested in this kind of recovery, we have a portal that's complimentary access to anybody. You can log on to the portal. You can create your own um, uh, register. Uh, nobody's going to call you about it. Nobody's going to bother you with it. Um, it's free. And there's a number of calculators there. One of them is for the heat recovery of the air compressor. And then if you have any questions, if you want more details for more complex applications, please talk to one of our ESCs because we can help you out with that. We talked about compressors. We talked about the boilers. But one thing is really crucial for me that you take out of it, out of this session, is don't think of it as in, in such a formulaic way. Think about other ways other sources of heat that you have. A lot of you will have welding facilities. And a lot of you will cool those welding facilities with the water of some sort. There will be a cooling loop. And you'll send that cooling loop once it did its job back to the cooling tower. Can you maybe use that energy from that stream before it goes back to the cooling tower and preheat some of your other streams? I've seen people who used cooling water from their welding machines to preheat their paint line pre-treatment um, pre systems. So instead of having a burner into the, in the paint line uh, cleaning solution, they used heat from the welding machines. 
save them about 100,000 cubic meters a year. So when you think about this, always think about where it's really hot in the facility. Can I use that heat? And if you have any questions or doubts, please contact one of us. We have no problem coming out to your facility and saying, hey, let's see what we can do about it. And we can share the experiences. We can share the, the knowledge that we have. One thing is that we get questioned often is, well, how would you possibly know all of our processes? Um, I worked in the design, uh, man, uh, designing of the custom machinery in my previous lives and in implementing capital project in, uh, measures in the automotive industry before. And I can tell you that every time somebody came to me as a customer and said, I want you to design something really special for me. We are really unique in what we do. Nine out of 10 times, it was exactly the same as everybody else with slightly different measures. Nobody wants to hear that, but ultimately, when you really think about all our processes, they're all very similar. It's very similar what we do. But even if it's unique to you, you know your process. We will not change your process. We're not going in there and say, you should tear everything apart, start from scratch. That's not our job. That's not what we want to do. We want to take knowledge that you have of your process and put together knowledge that we have of energy and how to use it and work together as a team. Our goal is not to say we know everything. That's not our goal. Our goal is to say we know what we know, you know what you know. Let's figure it out together. That's where our strength comes from. So these are some of the applications that we helped our customers with. Just to give you an idea of industries that we worked in. Roasters, pollution control, high temperature furnaces, industrial ovens, dryers, evaporators, autoclaves. That's in addition to the steam boilers, in addition to the air compressors, in addition to everything else. Between eight of us, we have pretty much seen every possible industry that is in Ontario so far. So if nothing else, we have an appreciation of what it takes to get a project implemented for you. What risks you're facing, we understand that, and we try to alleviate that before we say, let's do something. So going back to that energy cycle, we talked about the conversion losses. So what we're going to talk about next is the distribution losses. These are the losses that are fairly simple to, to, to understand, a little more difficult to quantify sometimes. And ultimately, depending on your um, facility, how well you run it, they could be significant or they could be completely insignificant. But it depends on your facility. It depends how good you are at converting energy and how good you are at using your energy. So let's see what the distribution losses are. If you have an end user, whatever that end user is, and you're sending energy to it, some of that energy will be lost along the way. So you have to generate the energy that's equal to the energy that's going to be used in the end user, plus whatever losses you're creating. So let's say those are the hot pipes, hot oil pipes, hot water pipes that are not insulated, steam pipes, condensate pipes. If you insulate it, you're going to reduce your energy loss. And as a result of the reduced energy loss, you can actually have the least, less energy being generated. So even though this can, in, in traditional terms, this is not necessarily what we, thought, what we think of as heat recovery you are recovering the losses that would otherwise incur, which would then gen uh, require your energy generation to be less. And you have to remember, less gen energy you generate, the less of those conversion losses you will incur as well. If you need to generate 100 horsepower out of your boiler and you lose 20%, you're losing 20 horsepower. If you only need 80 horsepower boiler to generate because you saved on the energy distribution losses, now you, you only uh, are going to lose 20% of that 80% uh, of 80 horsepower. So you're saving all the way at the back, not just in these distribution losses. So reduction in distribution losses also reduce the conversion losses. Example project that we've done with the customer, steam piping. We insulated three valves, seven flanges, seven pipe sections, and four retangular sections. So small part of the system, not all of it. 
these are the results. $14,000 investment generated $14,000 savings, one year payback, and with our incentive of $6,000, that practically brought it down to about six, seven month payback. That saved them about 93 tons of CO2E, 100 tons of CO2E saved just by insulating the pipes that are sitting there for a total investment of, of $13,000 minus $6,000 in, in rebates, $8,000. So not a big investment, fairly significant savings. 50,000 cubic meters saved. This is another thing that um, people always ask. Well, we're already using that energy because we send these pipes along and we're heating our facility. Yes and no. This is like saying, I'm going to keep using condensed light bulb because it heats my facility instead of going to the LEDs. By the way, did anybody notice that their heating bill went up since they converted to LEDs? Because it did. <laughs> right? But it's cheaper to heat with natural gas than it was with electricity, correct? Same, same thing here. Exactly. Same thing here. Usually you have steam piping out of the floor level, closer to the ceiling, because you don't want people to get burned. That's out of the way of the production, of the regular production space. So usually you have them run next to the ceiling. So even if they're contributing to the heat in the space, they're really heating the ceiling area. And what do you do with the ceiling area heat? You exhaust it out the ceiling. So you're really not gaining heck of a lot in, in the heating value of, of that non-insulated things. The other thing is, is that really the most efficient way? Is that heat where you need it? No, typically not. So just insulate it, get it over with. Even if the heating requirements go up, you're better off. So last point is end user losses. This is my personal pet peeve, and it's usually the hardest thing to convince you guys to do anything about because it's a sacred, sacred process. Can't touch it. Joe, who set it up, left 28 years ago, and we can't change it anymore. Funny story. I was um, working for a facility as a capital project manager, so I was in charge of the three facilities where we actually had to invest, uh, put new uh, machinery for the new processes, for the coils, for the suspension systems. Um, we had a break in the water pipe, and we started flooding the facility. Um, there was about 200 people in the facility, 200 people looking for the main valve for the water. We couldn't find it until we had almost a foot of water in the facility. Because the only guy who knew where the water valve is left 28 years ago. No joke. Took us forever to find the valve. Same thing happens on the processes. It's set up this way. We can't possibly touch it because that's the only way to run it. I have had people who run, um, for those of you who are familiar with the paint lines, you usually run them at 350, 370 degrees F because that's where you need to cure the powder at. I had people run it at 450, 460, 470 degrees F because that's absolutely the only way to run it. And when we really investigated, what happened is after 25 years of running, you have accumulated all sorts of things in the internal uh, ducting of the uh, re uh, recirculating air. So the air couldn't get to the product. It couldn't cure the product. So the only way to get around it is to increase the temperature. But it had to be run at that temperature. Nobody asked the question, why does it have to be run at that temperature? So those in automotive field, maybe now elsewhere as well, will know the five whys. You always ask five whys. Always a good idea. I go to meetings with customers, and if I ask you a question, why, and I look around the room, and half of you will be like, hmm, I know that I have a good opportunity. And that happens in 99% of the cases. So end user losses. Where can we look for them? First thing is, how much energy do you actually need in your processes? If somebody asked you, I'm doing this. Everybody would be able to explain what you're doing. 
Very few of you would know actually what is the basic requirement for energy. Forget the losses, forget everything else. What is it that you need? And it's really simple. You want to increase the product's temperature when you use heating for something, and you want to evaporate moisture or combination thereof. These are the only two reasons why you use heat. When you go down at the basics, basic principles, this is what you get. You want to increase the temperature, and you want to evaporate the moisture, combination of thereof. And you want to do that within the certain time boundaries. That's it. That's your requirement for heat. Very few people actually did analysis how much heat they need. So when you go into the facility, of course, we'll all say this is how much we need because that's what we were trained to do. Nobody, especially today, in busy times like this, nobody actually looks at it. Nobody actually has time to stop and think, what is it that we actually need? The other thing is, of course, in manufacturing operations, what are the things that you measured on? Very few will raise your hand if you say you'll measure on the number of cubic meters you use for the product. Or if you do, it will be lower on the priority list. First one will be, how many things did you, how many widgets did you make today? How many of those fit the quality control standards that we want and the customer wants? Because nobody wants a return. And the third one is, did we maim or kill anybody today? Health and safety. Those are the three things that I remember from my days in the manufacturing. Those are the only three things that we talked about. Energy was there, but really, you know, if you did all the other three, nobody will actually complain about energy. I mean, and because it's so crucial and so important, people are very reluctant to actually change anything on it. Even when you know that it could, risk of failure is much higher than the reward for being good. And we understand that. So we will not push you to do something that you feel uncomfortable doing, as long as you do that once you know all the facts. And facts are, there are lots of losses. Lots of them. We already talked the boilers, we talked the compressors, but on the end user side, let's look at the typical convection oven. Again, 100 units of input energy, Look at all the losses. And this is typical. Again, this is not my numbers. This is not Enbridge's numbers. This is industry numbers. This is typical convection oven, natural gas fire convection oven. Product gets about 20 to 25%, 22% in their case exactly, energy that you put in. $100 worth of energy put into the convection oven gets you $22 worth of benefits that you actually want. Everything else is a loss. Look at the exhaust loss, 44%, $44 of your $100 investment goes up the flue gas stack. And I know that half of you will think, oh, I'm doing much better than that. No, you're actually doing worse than that. And that's not knock against anybody, that's reality of life today. Very few will have convection oven that's newer than 20 years. 20 years ago, VFDs were very expensive. Nobody even thought about putting VFD of anything. So for those of you who have convection oven, you will know that the critical part on the startup is something called purge. Because when you start the oven, you want to purge it as quick as possible. You have to, by um, uh, TSSA standard, you have to have, I think, four times volume of the oven being purged before you can light up the burner. So for a sizable oven, that's a sizable amount of air. Nobody wants to wait for that for three hours. You're not going to call somebody in at 3 o'clock in the morning to start the oven for 6 o'clock start. So you want it to be purged in 10, 15 minutes. But you didn't have VFD, so now you're purging your oven all the time. That's where those exhaust losses are. So the most effective way to fight that is to put VFD onto the oven exhaust. Nowadays, those VFDs, those, those exhausts are relatively small motors. VFDs are very good price these days. 
So you can leave the operating purge mode operating at 100% exhaust. As soon as you get out of the purge mode, you go to whatever your oven requires. And your oven will require typically, what would you say, Paul? 30%, 20% of the purge volume? There we go. So 5 million uh, BTU burner, 1,000 CFM. But most of you, if you go back to the convection oven in your facility and you look at the numbers, you will have anywhere between 3 and 6,000 CFM exhausts. This is how you can calculate the energy in the stream. 1.08 times CFM times delta T. Regardless what kind of airstream it is, this is the energy that, goes, that you invest into that airstream. So if you have 5,000 CFM of exhaust that you don't need, that's 5,000 um, times delta T is 300, usually 350, 370 degrees F operating temperature, 70 degrees ambient, 300 degrees. So 5,000 times 300 is your basic energy that you're wasting every hour. The things that people get very um, confused about is what's in the exhaust. You have to know what's in your exhaust. If you're going to recover it, you have to know. This is not something you can just put back into the facility, like a little compressor, because this is actual exhaust. So you can only do air-to-air -air heat exchanger or air-to-water heat exchanger. You, you have to do some sort of heat exchange. You cannot use it as is. You can't just dump it back on. So if you never use a, a heat exchanger with the airflow, you need to know what's in the airflow. Is there something corrosive? Is there big particles that you have in there? What's in that exhaust? You need to know that because that will define what kind of heat exchanger you can actually have. The other thing is the biggest problem is finding a good heat sink. And that's important to understand because it's 300 degrees F, let's say, at the exhaust. If you're not going to take that exhaust and put it into the pipe and take it 300 feet away, you're going to lose a lot of energy. So you want to use that heat either directly in the same oven that you're taking it out of or somewhere very close by. Ideally, again, you want to use it for process. If you use it for the um, uh, heat uh, load, heating load of your facility, you'll only use 60, uh, 60, 40 to 60 percent of it, which increases your paybacks. So you have to figure out, is it appropriate heat source temperature if you have a heat sink? Is 300 degrees too much, too little? Uh, do they operate at the same time? Doesn't help you any if your heat sink operates only when the heat source is not available and the other way around. Uh, will the volume vary considerably? Is that exhaust going at the same volume? Is your heat sink going at the same volume? Will the heat sink cool something below the dew point? Will it condense? We already talked about this, process load or heating load, seasonal load. Which one you choose depends completely on your consumption pattern. So I'm not going to go to this because we do this a lot. But you should really look for the, if your consumption pattern looks like this, if you do last three years of your natural gas, and our ESCs can do this for you, and you have a lot of blue bars, which means a lot of process heat. See how low this steady, regardless of the, whether it's January or July. You want to look for the heat sink in your process. You wouldn't believe how many people will come with this profile and want to recover it in the seasonal load. Yes, it's obvious, maybe, but it's not going to help you anything. It, your payback will be through the roof. Right? So look for the sink in your process. And this is an example of one of our customers that did this. They took exhaust that was previously going at the stack of the oven. They put it into the air-to-air -air heat exchanger. And then they took the outside air, they drew it in through the other side of the heat exchanger, and preheated the air that was going into the oven. They had VFDs on both exhaust and the inlet side so they can match the volumes. So the oven stays balanced. And this is as simple as it got. $30,000 investment, $27,000 in savings. Even without incentive, one year payback. 
our incentive, 50% of the cost, brought that down to half a year payback. And all it did is took a little bit of engineering analysis to see what's available, what can be done, talking to a couple of vendors to see what the best quote is. This is what they ended up with. So to summarize this, recovering waste heat is not a question of whether it's a good thing or not. Of course, it's a good thing. The question is, can we do it? What makes the most sense? So I would encourage you to talk to your energy solution consultant. You can talk to them here. You can talk to them at your facility when they visit you. You can call them up to make sure that they visit you when you need them. And um, we'll figure out what is worth recovering for you, what is not. And then we can pursue it further with the vendors or something like that. We usually, for step one for us is to work on analysis, feasibility analysis with you directly without vendor involvement. We don't want to bring you five people who will want to sell you something right away. We want to figure out what, is makes, what does make sense for you. And then you can figure out which vendor you want to go with and all that process. So that should really be considered two different steps. And this is what we do all along. We keep talking about this. But for you, this will be familiar. This is continuous improvement. First, you develop some knowledge. You're attending this workshop. You read the case study. You look at the literature that's available there. You, you get knowledgeable about the subjects that you want to tackle. Then we can help you out with identify, identifying opportunities. We can walk through your facility. We can talk to you. We can discuss some of the ideas that you already might have and say, yeah, this makes sense. Let's put this one as a priority number two. Let's do this one as priority number one. Essentially, we're trying to find the sources of heat, trying to find sources where we can put that heat. What makes sense? If we need to, we don't just do the talking and just paper analysis. We have a capability of measuring the water flow if you need it. Uh, we can pay for some of the uh, additional submetering if you need to submit or something. Whatever it takes to get quantification of the savings so you're sure when you go to your boss and ask for $100,000 investment that you will get $100,000 back. Engineering analysis as well. All of our guys are professional engineers. All of our people are capable of doing a very, very competent heat and ballast analysis. And then project implementation, of course. Without that, there is no savings. We can talk about it. We can do analysis. But unless somebody in installs a piece of equipment, nothing else happens. So this is really what we are aiming for. And this is where you, we don't have preferred vendors. We will not go and say, you have to use this or that guy. We don't care, as long as they're competent. We can recommend some people, but as long as they're competent vendors and you're comfortable with them, that should be a guideline. Anybody can install these kind of things. It's not rocket science. And this is how we essentially provide help. Complementary development of knowledge, complementary opportunity identification. Some of the measurement is complementary. Some of it we provide incentives for. Um, complementary engineering analysis or we pay for a um, competent engineering analysis if you need somebody who is really specialized in some field. And ultimately, for those of you who implement the project, as we talked about before, you get 20 cents per cubic meter saved for the first years of saving, for first 50,000 cubic meters, and five cents thereafter. That's our typical regular incentive. And we'll talk about special offer a little later. So we talked about how to recover heat if your consumption profile is fairly straightforward. You have lots of process heat, little, little seasonal heat. So that's almost a, an ideal situation. And of course, it's going to be a good payback. The question is, what to do when you, your consumption profile looks this way? Where you have roughly half and half. Half of it goes into process. Half of it goes into your seasonal load. What to do then? Of course, now it starts to make sense to recover heat in your, on your seasonal load side as well. Question is how? Where, where do you get that heat? Where do you use it? How do you use it? And to be economical. So what can you do? Typically, people will tell you, well, you can buy new makeup air units, which is true. You can. Um, it's expensive. And we'll talk about it a little bit later. But also, you can put a glycol loop in front of your burner into your existing makeup air to preheat the air so your burner doesn't have to work as hard. And then the glycol loop takes the, uh, the waste heat that you have and uses that waste heat to preheat the makeup air you use in the facility. That's perfectly valid, uh, valid 
uh, waste heat recovery mechanism. And for some people, it's, a, it's very, um, it, pay, it pays back in a very short period of time. For some, not depending on your consumption, depending on how much makeup air you have. So we'll talk about it a little bit more now, um, about makeup air side of things. Or if you have a facility that, whose profile looks like this. A lot of our facilities in our service territory look that way in their consumption. What to do then? You have no option but to use it in the seasonal load if you want to use some of the waste heat. So things that we have to always question is the same. How much energy do you consume in heating? We've seen the profile, but is that profile telling you you're using total 50,000 cubic meters a year or 2.5 million cubic meters a year? Either one is a valuable thing to know. How much of the electrical load is converted into the waste heat? How much waste heat do you have? Because if your consumption profile looks this way, you have no process heat, therefore you don't have any uh, natural gas waste heat to speak of. But you still might have waste heat from the electrical cons consumers of energy. So do you know what your internal heat gain is? And a rule of thumb that I always use, if you think about facility as a closed loop system, if this room is our facility, and if you put 100 kilowatts into this facility and you don't ship anything hot off the press, you, sh you get it in in the ambient temperature, you ship out your product at the ambient temperature. So of those 100 kilowatts, probably 95 kilowatts will be turned into internal heat gain because that energy will be used to turn the, your conveyors for whatever else you might have on, on the electrical side um, uh, air compressors, all of that stuff generates waste heat. And waste heat has nowhere else to go but stay in that facility. So if you look at your electrical consumption, your electrical consumption is 100 kilowatts, and you don't have big uh, things that are outside of your envelope, most of it stays is your internal heat gain. What's your in facilities exhaust airstream? Again, if, if all you do is exhausting the space portion of your facility, not any process exhaust, just a space exhaust, typically you won't have anything bad in it. But if you do a lot of welding, you might have some particles in your exhaust. You have to be cognizant of it and know how to size your air exchange to suit. Um, is your equipment due for replacement? If you have to replace it one way or the other, then it might make sense to buy a new one that's more efficient. If you bought it 10 years ago and you still want to use it, or you don't have capital to change it now, it may make more sense to look at how can we improve what we have, rather than looking at buying a brand new one. What's your company's payback criteria? What goes into it? Are you looking at the life cycle of the equipment, or are you just looking at the first cost? Lots of people will say $50,000 um, piece of equipment is cheaper than $100,000 piece of equipment. But if $100,000 piece of equipment generates million dollars lifetime savings and a $50,000 piece of equipment generates $200,000 lifetime savings. Now you're talking different picture. What is it that your business case has to in involve? How many people know what your accountants actually take into, in, into consideration? All of those need to be taken into consideration for a successful waste heat recovery project, especially on the seasonal load. So what are the other options? If you have no, facility, no way of doing the glyco loop, for example, or you don't want to do it, or you don't have any process heat that generates any heat for the glyco loop to begin with, what other options you have? Well, now you're talking about purchasing makeup air units. New makeup air units that recover the heat from the facility, or redistributing ambient hot air inside the facility. So we'll talk about the second one first because it's uh, applicable and it's inexpensive way of heating your facility. What are the good sources of the heated air? Well, pretty much anything where you walk by and you feel the heat. You can probably do the list of your equipment that you have and think which one is heated, which one's not, all that good stuff. Or you can just walk by your facility and take a look at what your people are wearing. 
because you will have people in the middle of the winter in the short sleeves working around the high heat areas and will always be sweating in the summertime. And you have people uh, freezing next to the shipping doors. So you will always find where the heat source is just by looking at the people. So what can you do? How can you change that? How can you improve that? We want to take the heat that's concentrated around the heat source and we want to push it away inside the facility where we need heat to be. So we usually go from something like a process oven around the facility and into the shipping door area. It's a traditional way of doing it because those are the things that around the furnaces where I used to work, we had high heat furnaces and people could never get enough cold air. Even in the middle of the winter, they would have their door next to the, uh, the facility open. Snow would fall in right next to the furnace, but they would be so hot. In the meantime, the guys at the shipping door that were doing the tow trucks, we couldn't get enough heaters for them to, get, to keep them warm. And the thing that when we suggest that, everybody says, well, it just redistributes naturally. But that's not the case. In 95% of the cases, that is not what really happens. And there's a number of reasons. One is hot areas of the plant will have large volumes of exhaust air. Because what happens in the facility when people start complaining in the middle of the summer that they're hot? You usually put another exhaust on your roof to get that heat exhausted as fast as possible so that people don't walk out because it's too hot to work. Hot air tends to stay near the ceiling, just in your house. Near the ceiling is nice and warm. Your feet are usually cold. Same thing in the facility. So it doesn't do you any good if all the heated air is up near the 30-foot ceiling. So to improve summer conditions, as we said, all those hot pockets are quickly evacuated. So the heat doesn't have uh, uh, any opportunity to redistribute. Because usually what happens is you have so much exhaust above the hot areas of the plant that you're pulling the air not only from that side of the plant, but also through the shipping doors, through the shipping docks, forever air can come in. And now you're generating a drafty environment for everybody else so you would evacuate that hot air above the oven or extrusion equipment. That's very common. And that prevents that effective redistribution. So you have to have some way of mechanically distributing the air if you want to take advantage of this opportunity. So here's an example. Warehousing area. It was heated by using natural gas. Through the shipping doors, we had all sorts of air infiltration in the, in the wintertime. On the other side of the wall, we had a bunch of extrusion equipment. And what does extrusion equipment do? For those of you who know plastic equipment, it generates a lot of heat. So it was very uncomfortable because it was constantly hot, especially in the summertime. So to solve that, of course, these people have um, a bunch of exhausts on the roof. Well, these people use natural gas to heat the warehouse. George was there. He measured their exhaust, helped them measure it. We had 18,000 CFM of air leaving at about 42 degrees Celsius, believe it or not, out of the facility. That's a pretty hot air stream. So what they did is they put uh, temperature-driven dampers on their exhaust so that when it's cold in, this, in the winter months, they installed fans in between two areas that would draw this air, hot air from the blow molding, and it would dump it into the warehouse. So if I'm not mistaken, they installed something like 14 fans along the huge warehousing wall. So that allowed them to do is reduce the infiltration of the air because now you have air coming from the hot side of the building. So there's not as much opportunity for the cold air to come in. And that air was heated. You had 18,000 CFM of nice, cozy 40 degrees Celsius air. Once redistributed, that was nice and warm, so they reduced the amount of, need of the natural gas unit heaters that they needed in that space. So this was one of the more expensive projects. You have to remember, they drilled the holes through the wall, they put 14 horizontal fans, they put temperature dis uh, 
damper, control dampers on all of their exhaust in the blow molding area. And they still spend only $100,000 for a payback of 1.5 years. We're getting $15,000 for that. And they save 289 tons of CO2 equivalent. And this was one of the more complex ways you can execute this and more costly because you had to uh, cut, uh, drill the holes in the wall. You had to actually remove some of the wall area. You have to put 14 fans inside. It's a fairly complex project. And it's still paid back in 1.75 years with our incentive 1.5 years. Any questions or comments on that? Okay, then we'll go to our workbook example number two. So if you look at your workbook, this is the second one. We'll assume that the outdoor temperature, average temperature that comes into the facility is 44.6 degrees F. We'll say that we have a source of heat here and that we're exhausting 88,000 CFM of air at 82 degrees F out of the facility. We want to hit average indoor temperature 68 degrees F. We want to minimize the exhaust and we want to put socks that will move 60,000 CFM of air across to the shipping door area. So these are the inputs. Again, there is a symbol there, units of measures. And these are the formulas that we will use to do so. We'll use 4,500 hours of the heating season in this particular case, because that's typical what your facility will see in a year. And we'll add another twist here. We will say that this facility has this type of monthly consumption profile. So over the year, we will say they use 266,000 cubic meters of natural gas for heating of the facility. So we will see what the seasonal load is. That's just 266,000 cubic meters, the first one. We we'll wanna see what, how much natural gas energy to be recovered, and we see what the savings are. So we'll give you five minutes, and uh, again, those who are first and accurate will get reward. Correct. And, and this is one of the important points. The reason I chose this example is because you have a lot of vendors will come to you and will say, I have this new technology is going to save you 400,000 cubic meters. And it might. The problem is if you're only using 266,000 cubic meters, that's the maximum you can ever save. So we'll go back to question that pops up almost always when we talk about air redistribution. Are there any concerns with the air quality? Everybody's always concerned, can we just blow this air around? So if you're really concerned about air quality and that's the only thing that's really stopping you from implementing an idea like this, and it's worth your while because you calculated and the savings are sufficient to make an effort to do it, I would always suggest doing an air quality test if that's your concern. Air quality tests these days can probably have be had by for $1,000 or something like that. It's well worth the effort and it goes into your payback and it, the payback will still be with below a year for most of you. So that's the only concern I would have, the air quality. And in, again, very, very high majority of the cases that is never gonna be a problem at all. The other thing is people are saying, we just talked about insulating stuff. Why would you blow it around? Why wouldn't you insulate it? And the answer is yes. If you can, pipes, um, ducts, those kind of things, you can insulate, that makes sense. But usually it's really hard to add insulation to a convection oven, for example. It's not really a good thing to add oven on top of your regular oven um, shell. Because you will get condensation and what you will get is if the oven was not designed for that, you will actually ruin the oven much more faster than you would otherwise. So you don't want to necessarily insulate everything. There's times when you can, and there's times when you cannot. So if you insulated all the stuff you can, and you still have this waste heat, then you can use it by redistributing it around your facility. 
The other thing is um, you will get people who will redistribute this hot air around, but they will never change any of their settings. And what will happen is your facility will get warmer as a result. And if your facility was on the borderline of being too cold in the winter time, that's okay. But if your facility was already at 18 degrees Celsius and now you want to add heat and you're at 21 degrees Celsius, you may want to turn down your heating system. On most of the industrial makeup air units, the um, heat that's coming out of the unit is fixed. Because nobody goes and adjusts like they do here where there's people. It's just not that important. So that you have fixed amount of heat coming from your makeup air unit. So you may want to readjust that once you have an idea how much uh, heat you're going to recover internally. Again, I would encourage you to talk to one of our energy solutions consultants, not because we know everything, but because we can do this very quickly. You can do it efficiently at no cost to you. And you will know whether there is something uh, that is worth your time to pursue or not. What if you cannot do that? What if you cannot redistribute the air, either because the air quality is really bad or it's just not worth your while to fight the good fight of, of overcoming the perceptions? And your makeup air units are coming up to a replacement time anyways. So there's solution for that too. Um, there's two different ways of recovering heat in your makeup air units if all you have is a space heat that's escaping through the general exhaust. And we'll talk about both of them. Both of them require a purchase of the new units, and both of them will replace majority of your general exhaust fans. So that both, both of those things need to be taken into account. So if you have a roof, let's first see how the makeup air units works. So you take the outdoor air, you put it through the filters, through some fresh air dampers, you put it through the, over the direct fire, the uh, burner, and you blow it into the system. So you take outdoor air, and you create supply air that's heated, and goes into the facility. Sometimes you have some return air, sometimes you don't. Before you recover heat from your makeup air units, be aware how much of return air you have and how much fresh air you have. Because very, it's a very common thing that people come and call us. I have 50,000 CFM of fresh air coming in, of makeup air coming in, and I want to save all of that. And when you really do analysis, there is no way they can use 50,000 CFM of air and heat it based on the consumption profile that they have. And in nine out of 10 cases, what ends up happening, they have some return air they didn't take into account. Return air you can think of as almost freebie you only have to get heat it up by one or two degrees. Most of you are not concerned with the humidity levels, so it's not air conditioning. So you'll only lose one or two degrees at max, and that will not generate enough energy consumption for, you to be, to, for it to be worthwhile recovering. So what really we need to know out of all of this is then the space exhaust as well. I forgot to mention that. How much space exhaust do you have? Those two things have to be balanced. So what you really want to know before you go into the makeup air unit up upgrade to understand how the makeup air unit works and what is the energy used for. How much makeup air you have, how much fresh air you actually have, and how much recirculated air you have. Where are those dampers set for? What's the temperature of the supply air coming out of the makeup air units? So your space might be 70 degrees F, but your makeup air could actually be set for 90 degrees F to come out, out of the unit. So the energy going into those CFMs of fresh air that are coming into the system are up to 90 degrees F, not 70. And what's the operational hours? Do you know when those makeup units operate? Do they operate on the weekend when there is nobody in the facility? That happens all the time because they're not on a common system, so nobody's gonna go onto the roof and turn them off every weekend. But basically, if you don't have people in the facility, you don't need makeup air, period. So for space exhaust fans, I mentioned it's really important to have the balanced facility. Because if you have 10,000 CFM of makeup air and 100,000 CFM of exhaust, you will generate such 
imbalance in your facility, that no amount of energy savings will help you. You will still waste all of that energy. Step number one is have according numbers of CFM of air coming into the facility and CFM of air coming out of the facility. And again, in the majority of the cases, people will gravitate towards buying more makeup air and keeping exhaust where it is. And for only one out of 10 of you, that will actually be the right solution. Usually what we've seen is five to six times amount of exhaust air than what people need. Usually you have, if not enough, then even more than enough of makeup air coming in as it is. So if you look at your makeup air and you have 10,000 CFM of makeup air coming into the facility and you have 100,000 CFM of exhaust, first question should be, why do I exhaust 100,000 CFM? Not, I have 90,000 CFM or makeup air to make up for. And remember how we talked about how hot areas of the plant like to be exhausted in the summertime because it's hot? Usually that's where the additional exhaust comes from. Over time, people have changed their processes. It was welding before, now it's riveting. They don't need all those exhausts, but exhausts are still there or people are really hot in the summertime, they put exhaust under the ceilings, nobody turns them off. So first thing, if you have imbalanced facility, first thing is to ask, do I need exhaust? Only then you can ask, do I have enough makeup air? Because makeup air is there only to make up the air you need. So if you don't have requirement for makeup air, if you don't have oven that uses, say, 5,000 CFM of air, you do not need makeup air. Industrial facility, by and large, either if you're a specialized facility like pharma or something like that, industrial facilities, by and large, supply enough fresh air without any makeup air on the roof. If you have no process, you don't need makeup air. And when you do, make sure that your makeup air is interlocked with the process. Process stops, makeup air stops. For the exhaust, same thing, volume of air exhausted, temperature of the air, exhausted air. If it's too difficult to get to, if it's too difficult to figure it out, you can just assume that you're exhausting the air at the same temperature you have at the facilities level. So if it feels like 18 degrees Celsius, that's probably what your exhaust is like. Operational hours of the exhaust fans. Again, same things. 1.08 times CFM times delta T times number of hours. That's all you need for any of those formulas. So what happens if you have a makeup air and now you want to use some of that waste heat? So you will have makeup air units that you can purchase these days that will take the space exhaust and will put it essentially inside the unit and will force that exhaust to go over the heat exchanger that's placed in before the burner in the makeup air unit. So as the space exhaust leaves the space, goes through the air-to-air -air heat exchanger, preheats the outdoor air before it gets to the burner. And now you have essentially reduced the amount of energy you need in your burner by the waste heat uh, recovered in the heat exchanger prior to it. Okay. What are the things that you should consider when you look into this unit? How much is it going to cost me? Heat exchangers are not for free, so that's going to add to the cost of the makeup air. Are there any maintenance requirements? Is there something that you should know that your usual makeup air unit wouldn't need? Does that vendor have any prior installations in the similar environment? Do they understand the application? Not all applications are the same. What are the estimated savings? And this is a kicker. If you remember one thing out of it, remember this. Was the heat exchanger effectiveness over entire season? It's one thing that you have to be very cognizant of and aware of when you do this kind of equipment. Because what happens usually is at some point you will create frost in this heat exchanger. Different vendors have different ways of dealing with this. And it's really important that the vendor you choose to go with understands and you understand the repercussions of that particular way of dealing with it. So for example, one vendor that I know of what they will do is they will bypass the heat exchanger with a set of dampers and uh, your burner will start working just like normal burner without any heat exchanger. 
So the question now is, how many hours a year will that happen? So I had one vendor who says that every time the outdoor temperature is below 36 degrees F, they will go into some sort of reduced amount of air recovery, heat recovery. That's a significant portion of the heating season. So now your payback time starts to sp spread out. And this is not a bad thing. This happens. But you have to be aware before you install the unit. Return air plays a role here. Because if you have some return air, you may help that frost. They may use that return air to essentially defrost the heat exchanger at times. Again, know exactly what you're getting. Don't just settle for, oh, I have heat exchanger, and it's going to recover my heat all year long. So usually, that was a showstopper for me when I evaluated make up air heat exchanger systems, because the cost and the benefit when you take into account this heat exchanger effectiveness over the entire season just didn't pay out. It was paybacks were over four or five years. And if you can get that by your uh, facilities, that's great. I usually find customers cannot justify four to five year paybacks. So for, until recently, I didn't know of any other solution to it. I have recently found out from our friends at Union Gas Territory that there is a company out there uh, called Tempa Ventilation that have something called dual core technology. And those who know me well know that I don't usually hawk for our vendors. Um, you can choose whichever vendor you want to go with. So this is an ex exception to the rule because I cannot find anybody else who has this kind of solution. And even having said that, I have to say that just because they're the only ones doesn't mean that they're the right solution for you. Again, use your specific facility information to generate business case that suits you, regardless who the vendor is. So what do they do is this. They will have a space exhaust fan on one side of the unit. And they will have supply air uh, fan on the other side of the unit. They will put something that's called cores on two other entrances. And in first case, space exhaust stream will go through one of the cores before it ent exits out of the uh, unit. So it will preheat the core on your left hand side there with the space exhaust. It's sort of like a ceramic core, and it will absorb the heat out of the exhaust stream. And the exhaust stream coming out of the facility will be colder than what your facility is at now. In the meantime, the one that was previously preheated takes outdoor air that goes through the other core, ceramic core, preheats that stream of air, and it gets to be a supply air. Now, if your requirements are such that you don't need any burner, that's fine. You can use this unit without any burner. They sell it without burners. But if you need to add it up, they also incorporate the burner as well after this. The neat thing about it is if you look at the, in the middle those dampers, this works like this for about two minutes, according to them. And then they switch it like this. And now space exhaust preheats the other core. And the core that was just preheated is being used for the outdoor air to preheat it again. And every two minutes, that switches. For those of you familiar with the pollution uh, suppression technology, abatement, uh, abatement technologies, this is how a regenerative thermal oxidizer works. Two beds. One is being preheated with exhaust, while the other one is preheating the energy for the, for the, uh, for the recovery. Same thing here. These keep switching every two minutes. And because they keep switching so often, there is no frost buildup on them. Frost doesn't have time to build up. Or so they tell me. You can also use it as if you have unoccupied period. You can set up the dampers in this way. And all you get is air recirculation. So the air does not leave the facility at all. You can buy a specific dampers on the cores if you really want to prevent any air leaving or entering the facility in those times. So I thought that was a really interesting technology. And it's for somebody who has to 
buy new makeup air units, and they're looking to exhaust, uh, to recover some of the space exhaust heat, because that's the only heat they have available, this could be a viable option. Again, cost of that unit versus the savings, in warranty, maintenance requirements, whatever it is, that's up to you to negotiate with the vendor. But these are the things that you'll have to find out no matter which unit you get. I thought this was an excellent idea. Um, and it would be great if people had learned more about it. Any question of that before we go on to the last example? Okay, so let's do the last workbook example in which we will do heat recovery out of the space exhaust fan, 15,000 CFM of air, leaving the facility at 78 degrees F. We'll put it into air-to-air -air heat exchanger that can recover 450,000 BTUs per hour max. So this is essentially what we have. Space exhaust going into the unit and outer air, 13,500 CFM of outer air coming out to the other side. At 38.3 degrees F is average temperature in the Toronto area for the season. And then we have supply air coming into the facility. What we want to know is what is the temperature of the supply air coming into the facility, how much natural gas will we save with that unit, and we'll fill that into the table below. So another maybe five minutes. So up on the board we have the numbers that should match closely to what you get. Again, any questions, any requirements for clarification? Can you ask a question here? Or you can ask one of your energy solution consultants as well. So now we're going to go back to our exciting part of the workshop where we announce the new initiatives. This time around, we'll double the incentive of all heat recovery projects to cover up to 75 rather than 50%, 75% of the costs, up to $25,000 maximum. You have all of that in your, brochure, in your uh, package, all the details about that. And of course, small print applies and small print can be had by, uh, if you talk to your energy solution consultant, as usual. But this is a great offer. It's a great way of increasing, uh, decreasing your simple payback and making sure that you get heat recovery projects in the facility this year. So just to summarize it, it's been a long session. Um, but to summarize a couple of things, for those of you who use natural gas users and they have some sort of exhaust, you have to remember that the significant part of money invested into that gas user is actually being lost through the exhaust. And if that happens on two users, you're doubling your losses. So why not take some of the heat lost in one user, preheat, the, enter, the, uh, the stream that goes into the second user, which reduces the requirements, reduces the cost of the second user's running, and reduces the output of GHG's emissions as, at the same time. That's essentially what this does. It just captures waste heat. The other one is, of course, we know that if you have make a pair unit or space heating, it costs money to run them if you're natural gas. But we also know that running any sort of electricity user, such as air compressor, conveyors, electric motors, also run, costs money, much more than natural gas, might I say. But if we take some of that internal heat, that waste heat, and preheat, either make up air directly, we reduce the amount of energy needed to go into the make up air unit, or if we redistribute the heat around the facility without any recovery otherwise, we reduce the need for that makeup air to run as much. Again, saving the money. And you have to remember, when we talk about internal heat gain, when we talk about waste, when we talk about free energy, it's not really free. This heat, waste heat, you paid for. It's not free. So why not use it? So that's all for me. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them, either directly or you can approach me later. 
Otherwise, thank you very much for your time. I hope it was worth your while, and I'll see you next time.